So hello, first off, a little bit about me. Dorcas did introduce me very well, thank you so much. I am an outreach librarian at GLASS, the Georgia Libraries for Accessible Statewide Services. What I do is I manage our website, trying to keep it 508 compliant. I make our newsletter, including multiple different accessible versions of it. I've managed our social media back in the day, and I do outreach presentations, of course, going out into the community and talking with people like public librarians and telling them how great Glasses services are. So that's a little bit about what I do. Um, aside from that, I also am a member of a committee with ASLA, which is the section of ALA that serves special and cooperative libraries, and I'm on a committee with ALA, too. So, try to get out there and to share the skills that I have, and I'm going to try to share with you something that I would have found helpful when I worked in public libraries, and that is screen readers, how to get free ones, and how to turn them off and on, of course. So first off, what is a screen reader, and what is it not? Well, a lot of the times when I mention screen reader to someone, if they don't have a familiarity with it, they think, oh, well, that's neat, I can pull up you know, my favorite blog or website, and it's just going to read the story to me. That sounds really great. That's not exactly the point of a screen reader. They don't just read the text that is on a page. They're actually a piece of software that you either put on your device or already comes on your device that will change the way that the page is navigated so that you can navigate it even if you do not have any vision or if you don't have much vision at all. And also, because it's a computer-generated voice, it does not sound all nice and pretty the way an audiobook does. So it's not really an aesthetic experience. It's not something that someone's going to pull up on a dramatic news story they've read, and they're going to get a dramatic reading of it. It's going to take you to that news page, tell you how to navigate a bunch of parts of the page, and then it's going to read the story. So. When I list what it does do, again, I've already mentioned it helps you navigate a website or a page. It does help people that have refreshable Braille displays, too. These are devices that can be connected via Bluetooth or a cord to a computer, and it will basically translate the text from the page into um, Braille code, and it will make it show up on the device so it can read that way. So screen readers do output to this as well as audio just as an FYI. You may see more of your patrons that are wanting to use it in audio, but it's worth pointing out that it does do Braille output too. A screen reader does change the way the device works. People using screen readers generally are not using a mouse. They're going to be using a keyboard. And because of that, you end up using a lot of different keys rather than looking around on the page with a mouse trying to find the app that you want to open. And that's the somewhat downside, but the good side that you guys probably care about is it does turn on and off. So it's not like you're going to be installing something that changes the way the computer works and that computer forever can only be used for screen readers. No, it's pretty easy to turn them off and on. That way any of your computers can have a screen reader on them and to be used by someone that is coming up wanting to use it. So who uses screen readers? A majority of screen reader users are people who are blind or who have low vision. And it's worth pointing out the difference in definitions of these just as a point of interest. In the US, there's medically diagnosed central visual acuity of 20 over 200 or less in the better eye with the best possible correction and or a visual field of 20 degrees or less. That's what you define as someone who is blind. However, if you read into all of that, what you can kind of tell is that someone who is blind may have some range of vision. They may elect to not use screen readers with you guys. They may just use your large print connections. They may use a magnifier on the computer. Not everyone who is blind may use a screen reader, but a lot of people do. So that's where you'll get a lot of your users of it. And then you have people with low vision, which just in a nutshell, is people that may have trouble with common tasks, even with corrective lenses. You may have some people that just want to continue using magnifiers because they're easier than learning how to use a screen reader. But you may have some of your low vision patrons that are using a screen reader too. So that is just an FYI with that. You'll sometimes get other people that may use them or find them helpful, but a majority of your users are going to be people who are blind or have low vision. 
So what does a screen reader sound like? I am going to give a quick demonstration of NVDA, which is a really great screen reader that I use a lot. I'm going to use it on the Glass website. I will say that it may be a little quiet, so you might want to turn up the volume a little bit for the demonstration. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us to the website, and then we are going to basically let it run on the page and see how that goes, and just keep an eye out for it to try to figure out what's going on. And. from sounding kind of like a robotic nightmare if you're not used to it, what exactly was it doing? I'm going to go through each of these step by step. The first thing is that it reads menu items. Remember that screen readers are meant to help you actually navigate the page. They're not just meant to read what's on the page. So whenever we were on our Glass website, the first thing that it did was it actually tried to read my accessibility toolbar, which is on the right on the page, and which has collapsed. But it was reading through all the different parts of it. So someone who is using a screen reader would still see all the different options for accessibility, but they would not have to go and expand it the way we did as people who are presumably sighted. So that's the first thing that we have it do. So we want to make sure the users for our site can see the accessibility options right at the beginning before they have to turn through all of our different navigation bars. The next navigation bar that it goes to is it scans over to the top of the page and it starts reading my top navigation bar with home, catalog, find a library, and so on. It'll also give you a heads up if you've visited one of the links before, which I had for Bookshare. So it said visited link Bookshare. And when it scrolls over any of these, the user can um, basically hit enter and go to that particular page when they're using NVDA. And after that, it started taking down the rest of the page and reading the text of it. It was calling out my heading, which heading level one was about us, and then it started reading the text after it. So that's basically how a screen reader works. If you just turn it on and you don't play around with it or do anything special with it, it just starts reading through your document or your web page. And that's all the more reason why it's great to make sure that you keep your documents and web pages accessible because it may not always be user error that's keeping your patrons from visiting your web page or reading your documents. It may be that it's not made in a way that is helpful for them. So we are going to go back. Oh, the reason I have my tab key here, if you ever want to play around with your site and to get an idea of how it navigates, if you've clicked on the site and you start hitting tab, then it will eventually start highlighting the different parts of the navigation bar that it's going through, and then it will eventually start going through your links too. So if you want an idea of how people might be using the keyboard to visit your page, play around with that. It's really neat. And see if you can manage to go to different parts of your page or open different documents on your page uh, only using a keyboard. This one wasn't addressed too much whenever we turned it on, but it's worth pointing out. Screen readers sometimes have problems with homophones and punctuation. So if there are two words that sound the same, like read or read, it may not always figure out from the context what it is that you want to say. And so it just kind of makes it read a bit you know, funnier. It's not necessarily anything that's you know, breakable or that you can you know, help too much. But it's worth knowing. Something you can help with are your abbreviations. Screen readers like to try to read entire words. 
especially if there's a vowel in there. So say NASA, for example. If you're on NASA's page, NASA reads like NASA because there's an A in there and it figures out that it's a word and it pronounces it that way. It's the same with class. It reads class as class. But let's say that our acronym did not have the A in there and it was GLSS, then it would start trying to spell it most likely. And that's how a lot of screen readers try to handle abbreviations. So if there ever is you know, a club that you have that has a really cute acronym, it helps to spell it out the first time that you use it. That way someone can realize what they're going to. And sometimes screen readers will know that your IT department is visiting and sometimes it will read it as it department. So when in doubt, spell out your abbreviations the first time. And aside from that, it helps people to know who you are. Librarians love acronyms, so knowing which acronym applies to the group they're going to, very helpful. And here's one that's for your web developers, which is foreign words. Now, my NVDA license is from the United States. It is English, and it therefore doesn't always do that well with foreign languages. What this means is if I go on a web page that's written in Spanish, and they've programmed the page to have the language be Spanish, you know, then my screen reader can figure it out. That's fine. But if I go to a random page where someone has not listed that these various Spanish terms are in Spanish, then it will try to pronounce them, but with kind of a weird accent or way of doing things. The example I like to give is, think of the friend that you have that really, really wants to learn other languages, but they could just never get the accent right, so it always sounds kind of hilarious. It's like that. So if you're a web developer or if you're making a document that's in a completely different language, just be sure to go into the settings for it and to change the language over to the proper language. Another thing screen readers do is it reads important code. And the important code, aside from seemingly being everything, are things to make it easier for someone to navigate. It notes where the headings are. Screen readers give you the ability to hop between different headings. So if, you, if a screen reader user sees at the top of the page that the topic is you know, ebooks, they may be like, oh, well, I know ebooks. I'm just going to hop down a couple of headings and find out what exactly they have because I don't need to read all about them. So headings just make it a lot quicker for people to navigate what can sometimes be very big web pages. It also notes links, which again for my ebook uh, reader users, sorry, my ebook users, they might find it easier to just you know hop down the links on your page of you know free books that you can find and just go through, see which ones they know of and which ones they don't, rather than having to read the descriptions of each of them. So making sure to have your links properly labeled is really great for that. And I say also screen readers usually read graphics. There are ways to not make graphics read on your page. Like you notice the background of our web page on glass wasn't being read. It didn't say, you know, blue bar up top or anything like that. But what it does do is it will take images that I have put in there and put alt text on and it will read that. Alt text is information that you can put on an image that is meant to convey the meaning and content of the image. And it's helpful for people using screen readers and for people that have images turned off on their computer or device. It will show up for that too. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but first I have to get right to the fun part, which is screen readers that I recommend for different types of computers. Okay, so for Mac, there is one that I recommend, which is the one that's already built into it. VoiceOver is pre-installed in all of Mac devices. There's also a version of it that's in iOS devices, so yes, it is on your phone. It's really robust. It's constantly improving. Apple prides itself on accessibility. If you ever read Mac Life, then you will know whenever they have an accessibility update because they see that worth putting in their magazine. So it really is commendable what they have done. If you have a Mac, then if you hit Command F5, then it will automatically turn it on for you. If someone has Siri set up on their device, they can ask for it to turn it on too. But this does mean that it's something that's pretty easy for your users to turn on and off how they would like to. 
It is a high quality screen reader. I highly recommend playing around with it. And the good news with, if you have a Mac for your page risk to use, is that if they are currently using a voiceover on their iPad or on their smartphone, then it will be familiar to them. It will be easier for them to go from one to the other. And again, this one is free. This one is pre-installed on Apple devices. So that one has our Mac set. Windows has a couple of different options that I'm going to tell about. The first one comes pre-installed on Windows computer. It's called Windows Narrator. You can access it through the Ease of Access Center. If you have someone who is blind or low vision and is having difficulty finding it, you might have to turn it on for them. You can turn it on at the main screen. I believe it's in the lower left. There's like a little icon before you even log in where you can access the Ease of Access Center. And once you've already booted up the computer, of course, you can go and find it down under the Start menu. So you might have to turn this one on for someone. But once you turn it on, it's a pretty decent screen reader, and it's one that people will have a familiarity with a lot of the time, even if it isn't something they use on a regular basis. So next one, Windows Narrator. It is free. It is pre-installed on Windows devices. The next one is the one that I was using. It's NVDA, which stands for Non-Visual Desktop Access. Although, if you try to Google it, the first thing that pops up is a graphics card, which is apparently fantastic, but that's not what you want. Look for the screen reader, NVDA, and it is a free download. It does ask for an email address. However, I may or may not have registered mine with a fake email address, so you can definitely do that if you want to, just throwing that out there. And even if you put in a proper email address, I haven't had issues with spam. I do have NVDA on more than one device, so. Hopefully you'll be good there, but um, they are a nonprofit. They're pretty fantastic too. They're open source, so they're constantly upgrading and getting better. They do work on older systems. They actually have a version that works on Windows XP, as well as Vista and your newer ones too. It will probably need to be turned on for the user because whenever you install it, it ends up being a shortcut that's on the desktop. But turning it on is just double click, and then it wakes up and it starts talking to you the same way it did on my computer when I was showing you guys. So it's pretty easy. And it is a good product. It is one that I recommend. And again, it is something that is free. You can download it and install it on all of your computers if you want. Turn it off and on very easily. And it's a really good option for your patrons. The next one, I would be remiss if I did not mention this, even if I don't necessarily recommend it. JAWS for Windows, JAWS standing for Job Access with Speech, is a product by Freedom Scientific. It's a really nice screen reader. Because of that, it is really expensive. It is not a bad product. It's actually pretty nice. It does also have versions for older systems, but I tend to not recommend it as much just because the cost factor is pretty significant. It's several hundred dollars versus NVDA, which is free. So guess which one I'm going to lean more towards. But I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention it because this is a screen reader that you know a lot of your patrons who are blind will be familiar with most likely. Next, we're going to go to Chromebox and Chromebooks. This is another one that has a screen reader pre-installed. Hooray! So they have it labeled now as Chromebox Next because it's a fairly new product that they are still building on and making better and better. Um, but you might just see it listed as Chromebox. But I listed both because technically both are correct. It does turn on, or it can be turned on by the user by pressing Control-Alt-Z. So if you have a user at your Chromebox, they can just go up, turn on themselves, and immediately start using your computer before they even have to log into the computer. It's very handy. And because it's fairly young, there are less users of it, and there are probably less people that are familiar with it. But it is a growing screen reader, and again, I think it's pretty fantastic they put it on their devices. So now for my pie chart. Don't be daunted by the pie chart. It is interesting. Um, because primary screen reader for most people that responded to this really great survey from 2017, they said that JAWS was the one that they used the most, with a pretty close second being NVDA, 
then voiceover. And you'll notice on down in the tiny little slivers of different colors that Chromevox isn't really represented much at all. And same for narrator, they're just a little bit less than voiceover. And this was a pretty significant survey. This was 1,792 responses that were given to WebAIM, which is Web Accessibility in Mind, a pretty great nonprofit with some great resources on their web page. Definitely recommend looking at them if you're curious. But this extensive survey showed what we had kind of known, which is that JAWS is still the big boy out there. It's still a great quality product, but MVDA is definitely coming up behind it. So this begs the question, what if someone comes into my library and says, but I only use, you know, X screen reader? Well, it is a reasonable accommodation to give someone else a good quality product. You may not always be able to get someone the exact thing that they want. You may not be able to afford JAWS or have JAWS, but if you can give them other options like NVDA or Narrator or put them on a Mac with VoiceOver, that's a good reasonable accommodation. Screen readers do tend to use different buttons, but the navigation schemes tend to be similar enough so that I've watched people sat down at a screen reader they haven't used in a while and start beginning to navigate it. So just understand that what you're doing when you provide them with something that's different, you can still provide them with something that's very good. And that's part of the reason that I try to recommend some other options for you guys. And besides, you discover that people that use a screen reader, even if they have their preferred one, still know and or use other screen readers at different points. Like our little bar graph here shows that yes, indeed, screen readers commonly used are still JAWS and MVDA neck and neck. So over 60% of people use one or both of those screen readers. And then you see a lot more prominent with voiceover, which is probably from people that are using their iPhones and iPads. And you also see a nice bump for narrator, which to me kind of says that people that are using their preferred device may end up having to use a different one at work or at a friend's house or in a library and just navigate over to using that particular one. So I found that very interesting. So I kept saying iPhone, so it's worth pointing out there are screen readers that are on tablets and smartphones and they're pre-installed, so you don't have to worry about anything like that. We're going to start with Android devices because we are so proud of Google to start putting screen readers on their devices. It's only been a couple of years since they have given us TalkBack and it really is fantastic, um, mainly because Android devices tend to be cheaper, which is definitely a concern for a lot of people. But TalkBack pre-installed on these Android devices it works by swipes and taps because most people that are using a phone or a tablet probably are not going to have a keyboard hooked up to it. So instead of navigating by you know, the tab key and enter the way we did with our screen reader for our PC, we're going to be swiping our fingers and doing double taps whenever we need to select something. I don't recommend playing with this one necessarily because it's kind of hard to turn on and off. In order to find the on and off key, it's buried down under settings. And if you've already turned on TalkBack and you're not familiar with TalkBack, it can be kind of difficult to figure out how to navigate to that and turn it off. But I wanted to make sure you guys could use it and play with it if you wanted to. So I made a little video for it on my Google Nexus tablet using TalkBack. If you guys would just give me a moment to pull it up. And again, if you're having volume issues with it, you might have to turn it up a bit.
All right, and we do have that video that's up on the Glass YouTube page as well. And going back to my screen. And I just had to create that because I have had an issue with a friend that worked in a public library that sent me a desperate text one day saying, oh my God, how do I turn this off? I turn it on and can't turn it off again. It was delightful, but I commended them for learning, but that's what this video is for, it's making things a little bit easier. So iPhones are a bit easier turning off and on, good news. Um, so they are using the voiceover screen reader, which is 
basically the same that's in a Mac. They are pre-installed on most iOS devices, but the most is mainly a disclaimer. If you get a new phone, it's going to have it installed on it. It works by swipes and taps in a similar way to TalkBack. It's really, really easy to turn off and on. So it's the one that I tend to recommend playing with and trying to get a feel for rather than using your Android device. Because if you have a phone that has Siri on it, which I do right here with me, then you can just go, Siri, turn on voiceover. OK, I turned on voiceover. And that's it. And then if I want to turn it off again, then I can just tell it, Siri, turn off voiceover. And that's just a little bit easier than having to go through all the different settings that are for Android devices. Actually, the first time I learned how to use or how to turn the screen reader on Apple devices on and off using Siri, I had no idea. So I'm there playing around with it with the reader advisors for Glass and just could not figure it out. And finally, I went up to one of my coworkers, Jason, and I said, Jason, how do you turn this off? And he just sighs heavily, holds out his hand. I give him my phone, and he says to it, Siri, turn off voiceover. And it turns off, and he just walks off. I'm like, well, that was easy. So that was how I learned. And just passing that on to you guys so that you don't get to have that great embarrassing moment. Although he was a great sport about it. So quick tricks for email and for websites. These are just little things that you can do to make your emails and to make your websites friendlier for your patrons. So email, just a couple of different things that make it better. The first one, which is a really big one that I've seen a lot, which is avoiding using text images or give a text equivalent for your text images. I mean, we've all seen, you know, party invitations and stuff like that that will have, you know, some little cute ad or something like that in it. Those actually don't read with screen readers. It's not possible to add alt text in Gmail. You can in, like, say, MailChimp and Constant Contact and stuff like that. But in your everyday email, not so much. So if you include an image, if it's something significant, be sure to describe it or to otherwise give the information that is in it. Next part is to use bullets. There's actually a built-in feature in your email to automatically add bullets for you uh, rather than you know, using asterisks. Asterisk? Asterisk, there we go. Rather than using asterisk or anything like that. And it just makes it a little bit easier for a screen reader to navigate and to understand everything goes together. Watch acronyms. It's very similar to what I mentioned earlier with screen readers. Acronyms can be kind of weekly with email. So if you have a cute name for your book club, spell out the name of the book club and then put the acronym in parentheses. That way people know what it means. Meaningful links is a really big deal on both your emails that you send out and on your website. What that means is whenever you have a link, an outgoing link to a website or something like that, instead of saying click here, you list in the text of the link what it is. So like if you look at the Glass web page on the main page, there's a link to individual application. That way if someone goes over that link, they know exactly what it is. They don't have to have it you know, be like click here and then have to worry about if it's going to take to them to some weird part of the internet or something. So meaningful links, fantastic. And then last but not least is what's in the attachment. If you include an attachment in your email, it's sometimes nice to let people know there is an attachment because otherwise for all they know, it's a virus piggybacking on there or it, just maybe like the little picture that comes in your email signature or something like that, the way some emails do. So I'm going to show an example, if I can get it over. Yes. So an example I made of a winter celebration, it's a text image that's an ad to get my friends or coworkers to go to this fantastic winter celebration in room 503. The problem is this image is not going to read at all with a screen reader. So if I send it to one of my coworkers who is blind, they're just going to see that there's an image there and I'm asking, will you be there? And the answer is probably not. So what I would recommend instead of something like this, if you have to have your image, you know, feel free to attach it if you want a pretty ad or invitation for your event. 
but just take all of the pertinent information out of this and to include that in text in the actual email. That way people that are using screen readers can read your invitation. Plus, you know, aside from that, there are a lot of us that like to copy paste information from emails into our calendar and you can't really do that if there's an image. So it's just a friendly thing to do all around. So websites, first my official disclaimer, this information is not meant to make your site um, 508 compliant, it is meant to just give some little tips to make it friendlier, tips that anyone can do, so if you're the person that has to sometimes update the teen blog or something like that, then this is information you can translate over to that to make sure that your blog posts are accessible. And they don't require much coding, yay, which is sometimes good. So first off on websites, this is a little coding thing, but it's pretty easy, um, which is putting headings. Headings help someone navigate the important topics of the page. So the most important thing is heading one, and anything nestled under that is heading two, and then three, and so forth. So use headings rather than just bolding something or putting it in really bright colors so people know it's significant. Make it a heading, and then maybe do all that stuff. That's a friendly way. Next one is watch your font, which I listed in three different types of fonts. Um, watch your font means not just make it sans serif typically if you can help it, because that is considered to be pretty friendly as far as accessibility. But don't use really odd fonts. Those are difficult for a lot of people to see, not just people who are low vision or blind. And if you have large chunks that are all in something weird, like say italics, it will notify someone using a screen reader when it changes over to different font types a lot of the times. And so you don't want it to drive them crazy when it's hopping among a bunch of different styles that you have done. So basically, you know, keep it kind of simple. You can make it look nice without having tons and tons of stuff in there. Meaningful links, very important on the web page in addition to the emails that I had mentioned before. And, but I've already covered that, and I think I've already covered acronyms pretty well too, so I'm going to skip over that. Now, alt text, we had mentioned before, it's the meaningful information that you put on an image to convey what is in the image for the individual. And it's read on screen readers and people that have images turned off on their computer. I'm going to show what it looks like in WordPress, because I know a lot of libraries are using WordPress. I'll also point out some of the other things that I had mentioned, like headings and all of that. Okay. So first we're going to look at a page. Just a minute, Blech, sorry, just to mention some of the basic things that I said. Okay, so when you're on our page for Bookshare, if you look at the code part of it, and if your eyes are glazing over, bear with me. We're going to go back to the visual in a minute, I promise. But you can see where I actually have the first title of it labeled as Heading 1. Then later on, registering for Bookshare is Heading Level 2. And there's a 3 down here and a 4 too. So that's just an example, and I've also used bullets in here in order to make things easier for people who are navigating it. But even aside from that, you can just look at the visual part of it and you can see where I've made all the links to be something meaningful. That way someone can you know, scroll through and say, oh, well, the individual application is here, I'm just going to click that. You know, rather than having to go through a paragraph to figure out from the context of the paragraph what they would like to do with the link. And I have a lot of images here, and if you look at the back side of them, you can actually see where the alt text is. But good news, in WordPress, it's a lot easier to add than going into all of this code stuff. In WordPress, you can click on media, and you can upload different documents there, as well as media images, like the ones that we were looking at. And I'm going to pick one that I've done before. WordPress gives you a couple of different fields that you can fill in for your images. I do recommend putting a title just because 
some things will read that, but the title is not as important as the alt text, which is going to be the description that is going to be read by a screen reader. So with this one, there's a puzzle of a globe with two hands holding pieces. There are two other fields that are in there in WordPress. A caption is what it sounds like. It's going to be text that is going to be immediately underneath your image whenever you put it in your page. I don't really use captions, and so we don't have these filled out. A description is useful depending on how many images you use and like to reuse. That's where you basically just put something that is meaningful to you to help you find that image later. Like if this was my favorite image or one of them, I might put my favorite image. That way whenever I am searching my media items, I can search and I can find that particular one. But it is the alt text field, not the description one, that is going to be significant for your screen reader users. And I highly recommend, if you are someone that updates a teen blog or anything like that, that whenever you update your images or put a new image in, that you immediately add alt text in it. Because it is such a headache to have to go back through everything and to figure out the proper text for the image and to put it into tons and tons and tons of images. So do it as you go along, it makes life a little bit easier. And I already skipped right past my demo slide where we showed off WordPress. But I'm going to just give an idea in pie chart form of why it is helpful to do some of the things that I mentioned. In the same survey of seven, I'm sorry, 1,792 respondents, uh, WebAIM found that a lot of the people, whenever they are trying to navigate a lengthy web page, they use headings first and foremost. So it's very significant to have those on your page to make it easier for people to hop down that big long bibliography or series of bibliographies that you've made. The next thing that they use is find, which I'm sure we've all used before, control F, find, fantastic. Um, that's not as relevant to what we've said, but it's still very helpful. And it's worth pointing out that if the text is in an image, find is no good for that because it's not going to see the text at all, just the image. Navigate links is what I was doing when I was hitting tab earlier, where it's taking through the navigation bar. It will hop down to the links that are on a page too. And so those three big things right there are part of the reason why I pointed them out to you today, because they are things that screen reader users have reported that they find very helpful when navigating pages. And that was it. I know I talk fast and a lot. I always welcome questions. If you ever would like to, you can always email me at sirvin at georgialibraries.org. You can also call me at 404-235-7157. I'm always happy to help how I can. Plus, I find it interesting. So tell me what you find out and what you find interesting. Thank you, Stephanie. We do have um, um, a few questions for you. Yay. And our first question comes from Cynthia, and I do believe it was during the, the, the portion where you talked about um, where you did the, the demonstration of the screen reader yeah. um, on the glass site. Yeah. So her question was, um, can the user slow down the reader? Yes, they can. They can slow it down and speed it up too. In fact, that's part of the reason why it's a robotic voice rather than a human voice, because if you speed up a human voice, it can be kind of hard to work with. But yes, you can adapt it, and you can with the screen readers that are on tablets and smartphones too. Okay. Um, also, I guess to piggyback off of um, Cynthia's question, um, Janice asked, why does it have an English accent rather than an American accent? Um, <laughs> can you change it like the one that you can change on a GPS device? Or and can you also, can you make it male or female? Or make it female rather than male? So I was using NVDA, which comes with the default voice you know, for the free version, and it was made in Australia, so I don't know why it has the British accent, but that was their choice. It is possible to download and purchase different voices for it, but I have not elected to do so because it's an extra expenditure. But it is something that users can do. 
Okay. Um, Kimberly asks, is the NVDA, is it something that can be installed on the computer? Um, and also, she says she missed some information. Could you please explain how one would get the screen reader on library computers? Okay. So with NVDA, it's a free download off their web page. You just have to go there. They'll ask for a donation. You ignore that. Or give to them, whatever. And put in an email address and it just immediately downloads. Um, or if you can't download onto the library computer, you can download it onto a jump drive, carry it over, and then install the .exe file. So that's basically how you do it. It's a pretty quick installation, too. But you can just download it off their web page. What's the um, web page? Where is it? Let me pull it up. It's going to be at nvaccess.org, and once you're there, you can just find the download button. And like I said, don't be daunted on the calls for donations. That it's not something that you have to do. You just have to find the right toggle button to skip over that. Okay, so it's in, in the um, NVDA, that is the free screen reader that you have been referring to. Yes. Correct. Okay, so um, William, I'm, I hope that that answers your question. Um, someone said that, Kimberly mentioned that you mentioned something about text braille output. Yeah. Text to braille output. Yes. Could you repeat that or go over that again? That's fine. If someone has their own refreshable Braille display, then they can um, connect it with your computer, turn on a screen reader, and instead of outputting as audio, it will put it out as Braille. I'm trying to find a good picture of it real quick, just a second. Ah, this one is close to mine. All right. Let me share. All right, so if you look at the one on the screen, this is an example of the HumanWare Brilliant. It will sit up against a computer keyboard or an iPad, interestingly enough, and it will connect with it. Those little dots will basically pop up for the Braille code so that someone can read in front of the computer. This one also has keys behind it for typing in Braille. You won't see them too terribly much because they are cost prohibitively expensive for most people. They are very nice. Although hopefully a cheaper one will come out soon. Knock on wood. But I suspect you won't see too many patrons with this. And if you do, they'll know how to hook it to your computer. It does require some tech savvy. OK, we have another question from Emily. Um, she says, because Chromebooks are delicate beasts <laughs> and, and um, they don't run on Windows, would NVDA be a good thing to try and download, or would you recommend sticking with Chromevox? Uh, your Chromebooks will probably not take downloads, so I tend to float towards using Chromevox. You can try it, but I have a Chromebox here, and it did not want me to install anything on it. So I just used the built-in reader. The built-in reader is not bad. It's just new. And will get ever better. I believe in them. <laughs> we have a question from Teresa. She says, when using JAWS, I'm sorry, we have so many questions. It removes the um, previous question. Okay, so she said when using JAWS, is the pricing shown before using? I tried looking it up, but I could not give a straight enough answer to present in a slide because it depends on a lot of things, like if you're getting a, a group discount. And I know one of my coworkers had mentioned getting a discounted version by contacting them. But it was not something I could give a straight answer for, so I didn't want to list the price. But I can say, it is several hundred dollars, regardless. It's kind of steep. It's good, but it's steep. <laughs> we have um, William who 
this may be two part, but I'm just going to read it to you, Stephanie, and if I need to, if you need me to break it down again, I will. Um, it says, when downloaded to a public accessible computer, can the icon be shown on the desktop so it can be accessed from there? Um, based on what you shared, the librarian would have to click on the icon to turn it on, right? Or is there an additional step once it is open from the desktop? With NVDA, there is an icon on the desktop. The reason you might have to have someone turn it on for them is because if someone is not able to see it on the desktop, then they might need help with that. So you can keep it there in a place where they can find it, and once someone knows it's there, theoretically, they can do it themselves. But I just like to give a heads up that you might have to turn it on for someone. But yes, NVDA is a desktop shortcut. Things like uh, Chromebox, you can access through accessibility features, and the same for uh, Narrator. You can probably make a shortcut. I just haven't played around with it yet. But it's pretty quick from, Chrome, uh, from Chromebooks. Do we have any other questions? And those are some great questions. Yeah, I like good questions. Thanks, guys. Well, if not, then um, we'll go ahead and close out. Um, Stephanie, I just want to thank you uh, for being here today, and I want to thank everyone for attending um, this webinar. Um, once again, this session um, will be recorded or has been recorded, and it will be archived in the Georgia Learning Center as well as posted on YouTube. So if you're on the Continuing Education Listserv, um, I'll send out an email letting you know that the, um, that the video is ready for you to view. Um, and also, once you leave here today, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you would complete that with your feedback. And lastly, thanks again, and be sure to join us next month um, for next month's Power Hour session, and more information about that um, will come. So thank you all, and have a good day. Thanks, guys.